Hello and welcome to Comic Book Showcase episode 11. Uh, my name is Jamie Harry, I'm the founder of the Marvel and DC databases and today we've got a great topic for you as always. Uh, probably one of the most renowned series of, in all of comic book history and certainly an ideal one to be remade for uh, film and TV, various franchises. Um, Days of Future Past, written by Chris Claremont and drawn by J uh, John Byrne, if I'm not mistaken, in January of 1980. Um, definitely an influential story uh, for writers to come. Uh, you know, everyone wants to get a piece of this story, uh, tell their, their sort of uh, take on it. Um, it was retold in X-Men animated series in 92, 93, somewhere around there, and uh, has made uh, numerous appearances in comic book uh, pop culture references, uh, various shows and whatnot. So joining me as always, I've got uh, Kyle, Rab, and Mike, um, experts from the Marvel and DC databases. Um, let's get started talking about the movie, uh, obviously just in theaters right now. I actually really enjoyed the movie. Um, I thought it was uh, well acted, well written. The uh, cinematography and sort of visual effects were pretty good. Um, it was a little bit of a departure from the actual comic book story, but uh, not far enough to be too, uh, too much distraction uh, from uh, just a generally entertaining film. So uh, I guess I'll put it out there. What did you guys think of the, the movie? You know, I really enjoyed this movie. I thought it was one of the best uh, X-Men Marvel movies since uh, X-Men 2. Um, although I really enjoyed The Wolverine, um, this movie really like played it out there. And especially having so many characters that they have with both past and present, it was like it, they played it really well. It was almost like uh, an Avengers-style amount of like action and energy and like drama and character development as well because they're kind of playing off all these new characters from the X-Men First Class uh, movie that they've brought over and developing that storyline to continue into other storylines as well. So I really liked how they're developing um, Magneto and Mystique and Charles as these like pivotal characters in that universe and uh, it's, it's really nice to see. I really enjoyed it. Rob, you've seen the movie. What did you think? <laughs> I have seen the movie. <laughs> I thought it was great. Um, I I think it also sits very high on the uh, scale of at least the X Men movies for Marvel. They I I was sort of less a fan of the uh, initial like the, the the original trilogy with uh, Scott Summers and Jean Grey and those characters, and I really, really liked First Class. Um, why, why, didn't you, why didn't you like the trilogy? What was that about? That was I, I, I think it was good. Like, at the time, it was good for what it was, but then First Class comes along and blows it all out of the water, and I think there was a lot of sour taste in people's mouths. Those movies these were like pivotal in creating what we know as comic book movies now because they pretty much set the bar for comic book movies uh, like as we know them because previous to that you had a couple of like really cheesy like the Captain America and Punisher movies that weren't really really good like I'm talking the original Captain America movie from like the 90s yeah. that is like him in the full like unitard spandex stuff not like this nice leather outfit but anyways they they still like they Aside from X Men Three, because they seem to be really pushing the envelope there of what they're going to do with storyline, and like just like decide to kill off a whole bunch of people, but it just seemed to like you know they really put it out there of what comic book movies should be like. I agree. I think it was a very uh, it was a pivotal moment. <laughs> those, those first three, or the the first one at least, was a pivotal moment in comic book movie history. I can't remember which... Did Spider-Man precede that? The Sam Raimi Spider-Man? That was 2001? I think I think Spider-Man preceded X-Men by one year, I think. I could but be wrong. I think because it's sort of so early, like, it, it's before Batman begins, so you don't have, like, a... You don't have that realism that we came to expect from a movie, like wanting it to be like, I guess I guess my criticism of the X-Men franchise in general is that it's a bit cartoony in terms of like, even though they changed the suits, they're still wearing jumpsuits, and uh, not that I have a huge problem with that, but I think when you mix the two in this latest Days of Future Past, it seems kind of... Uh, incongruous 
<laughs> like it's incongruous to have like the uh, first class, which seemed a little more up to date in terms of what we were, in terms of what we like from a superhero movie, and then meshing it with that cartoony world of the first three franchises or the first three movies in the franchise. That's my opinion, anyway. So, so hold on a second. So, uh, are we completely dismissing what DC did in the '80s? Like, I mean, you look at um, uh, yeah. Jack, Nichol Jack Nicholson's sort of. Uh, portrayal of Joker. I mean, those movies, with the exception of uh, George Clooney and that disastrous sort of run there. But I mean, the Batman movies of the 80s and 90s were not horrible if you add it all up and average it out. Um, DC owned the box office when it came to superhero movies in the 80s for sure. Um, and I agree that X Men and sort of the first Spider Man, the same Raimi uh, Spider Man number one, set the new bar. But um, are we saying that basically this is a, a new a new period in, in comic book history, or do, are we saying that um, you know the the eighties movies just don't count? Well, I'd have to say that like you want to say they averaged them out. It's only because the first Batman movie was at like ninety nine percent of that average, and the other three movies were just horrible garbage that got spewed out that didn't even have the same like two uh, Batman Returns. That had kind of that same theme that Burton was working on, which was okay because, I mean, I don't mind Michelle Pfeiffer in a suit made of leather that is that tight. Um, but Danny DeVito's uh, Penguin was really over the top, and it started that slippery slide into that really extreme Batman nipple suit, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Mr. Freeze, and it just, like, things... And Bane... Bane. It was horrible. That's like, a contentious statement. But I think... Uh, I'm, I'm not saying we should discount everything that came before, but I'm saying that we should consider that each new movie like has to learn something from the movies before it. So if Batman and Robin, like the George Clooney movie, was not great, then the next superhero movie has to be way better, or else. And then... So we get Spider-Man, and that was really good. Spider-Man 2 was also really good. I mean, they had flaws, but at the time, they were our first Spider-Man movies. And uh, then X-Men comes along, and that sets the bar even higher. Then Spider-Man 3 happens, and that's not great. And then X-Men 3 happens, and that's not great. And then Iron Man happens, and that's really good. Like, Iron Man set the bar again. And then... So we, we move on from there. So what did Days of Future Past add to the genre that is now going to be the new... So everyone agrees that it was a good movie, I think, and Kyle, uh, please chime in. But if it is good and better than sort of the, the, the last four, three or four movies, what what's the new bar? Like, what, what is it? The acting? Is it the writing? Is it t retelling of old stories? What is it that sets it apart from, say, the Spider-Man 3 or the X-Men 3? I think it's the tone of the movies. Like we, like the '80s and you know '90s Batman kind of started this over-the-top, uh, comedic almost. And looking back, you kind of superhero trope or whatever you want to call it. And then the X-Men movies and Spider-Man kind of real, you know, became more of a real-world, serious take on superheroes. And then we kind of get into Iron Man and the Avengers, and they kind of finally hit that medium balance between very serious and comedic. You have you have a serious, realistic movie, but you also have lighthearted and you know comedic moments within the movie, and it is, it's finally kind of hit that middle ground of like the right amount of each. So the the story itself was a bit of a dark story, like the you know half of the characters you know are either dead or dying, and it's a bleak future. Um, but I think it's an appropriate story for re uh, for being retold in film. So um, does anyone have an opinion on? Like, why Why did Days of Future Past get chosen over other stories? Why was it appropriate for re retelling in, in, in the movie sort of cinematic universe? I was just going to say, I believe it allowed them to redeem themselves from X-Men 3. Because with doing a time travel movie, it allows them to do essentially what they did and undo wrongs that were done in that movie. Because they really... Uh, they dropped the ball in that last X-Men movie back in the late, whenever, 2000, 
or 2009 or whatever. But, like, they allowed them to pick things up where they could take the series in, a, like, a new direction with closing off kind of that other uh, character storyline that they had with the, um, the original cast. That's a, and I get a good point. I think I was almost... I wasn't expecting them to do this. Like, I wasn't expecting them to go and use the uh, Brian Singer franchise characters. Like, I thought they were going to stick with the X-Men First Class cast and just move on from there. Although, since that was set in the 60s, I don't know how they'd move that up to the present day using the same cast. But I, I expected them to do that anyway because I thought First Class was kind of a reboot. But it's a nice thing that they have combined them because then, like, we like continuity in things, and so when they connect the two, it feels good. And uh, I think they did it well. I think they did a good job of connecting the two franchises and uh, seeing the characters progress. Like, you see the development of the old characters and the new characters at once. <laughs> so that's an interesting point you bring up is continuity because Marvel in the comic book universe anyway has historically not been uh, very well organized uh, in terms of continuity and I know Mike you and I have talked in the past about um, sort of the continuity errors or changes or inconsistencies. Um, what did you think about the movie in terms of how this one tied into both the Brian Singer and the X-Men uh, First Class sort of series and and like Wolverine's Claws is a great example of some of the inconsistencies. How do they? Uh, did you notice any inconsistencies there? So for Wolverine's Claws, if anyone who's seen the Wolverine at the end of the movie, he ends up losing his adamantium claws and is left with bone claws. And you know, it's kind of funny to see that in future Wolverine, he's got his adamantium claws back and. It's there's no explanation of what happened. It's just take it for granted that, you know, he got them back somehow. And it's really interesting because, I mean, the process that put him into the adamantium body as we know him to be was extremely painful for him, and it took a, quite a toll on him. So uh, they play off in maybe the next Wolverine movie how he ends up getting his adamantium claws back. You know, the, there's a lot of places that they could go. And they don't have much time to do it, or do they just ignore it, next movie comes along, he's got claws, or we never see future Wolverine again. Like, who knows? Um, and then another thing from the Wolverine movie, if the, the stinger at the end of that movie, you see, lo and behold, Charles Xavier is back from the dead. Um, it, as everyone knows, if they've seen the X-Men 3, uh, Charles dies at the end, and in kind of like a stinger-esque kind of uh end of that movie, you see a patient inside of a hospital speak with uh, Charles's voice. So you know that he's still alive, but possibly he's inhabited a different body. We don't know exactly how that played out. Now, in uh, the comic books, at one point, he had faked his death, and he was actually hiding deep underneath the X-Mansion, because um, the, I believe it was the Fanlax, were attacking, and he needed to be able to hide in order to mask his presence and uh, fake his death. And so, you know, it's not unheard of that a character has faked their death in order to um, seem dead to, to be able to come back later and, you know, because some great evil was coming towards them or something along those lines. Um, so, I mean, I don't know whether it was just a faux pas or they just completely missed those previous uh, things that had occurred. The fans certainly picked it up and said, you know, there's clearly some omissions there. Um, but when you're dealing with time travel... So it is actually a different... It is actually a bit of a different twist the way they, they handle time travel. Um, not your standard fare, but um, with that note, actually, we are out of time for this week's episode. Um, uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, how DC interplays with this story and, and how uh, they have their own equivalent time travel uh, stories going on right now. And uh, so join us uh, in, in the extended sort of version of our, our episode this week. But let us know in the comments what you think uh, of this week's show and what you thought of the movie and what you think of the characters. And I'll leave you with one final question. Uh, what did you think of the Stinger? Stingers are becoming, um, you know, the next big thing in terms of movies. Everybody's starting to do them now. And uh, 
En Savanur, also known as Apocalypse, made uh, an appearance in this uh, Days of Future Past stinger, and uh, it was a little oblivious, but it obviously set things up for the next movie. So what did you think of the, uh, the Apocalypse stinger? Uh, so that's it for this week's show. Thank you so much for joining us. And that's a wrap for another episode of the Comic Book Showcase. Join us again live via chat or Twitter next week. Like us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter. And to learn more about today's topics, check out the Marvel and DC databases on Wikia, the ultimate resources for comic book information anywhere.